there's nothing more relieving when there's someone with that you think might be carrying a gun and they're trying to hold you up for money and you just offer them a fucking chicken finger out of your pocket. Welcome, everyone, to This Was The Scene, the podcast that takes a look back at the late 90s, early 2000s punk scene. I am your host, Mike Doyle. Tom Martin, or Crazy Tom Martin, as the kids call him, is a Pennsylvania legend known for his time in 30-year freshman and throttle jockey, which was a band that he was in with Brian from Plow United. Which, if you've been listening to the podcast, you will know is episode 41, and you should check that out after you listen to this episode. I've talked about Tom on so many episodes that I just had to get him fucking on here, and I reached out to my buddy John Price, who I've also mentioned in many episodes. I said, who should I get on the podcast that would make you happy? And he said, Tom Martin. And uh, I was like, I don't know if I can get him on, but I'll try. And luckily, Tom is on social media, and we had a chat. He really liked the podcast, and I said, I need to interview you. And he said, absolutely. So uh, it was completely fucking worth it, and this episode is amazing. If you get a chance to look up some of his newer stuff on Spotify, just look up Crazy Tom Martin. You should definitely go do it because it's really fucking good. And I've added his song Summer Legs to my personal playlist because I can't get the damn song out of my head. It's super poppy, and it's really fucking awesome. So go check that out and add it to your playlist or play it a lot. I got Tom on the phone, and this is what we talked about. Hair metal, recording super weird music as a teenager, Lollapalooza, calling the Villanova radio show on Saturday nights because he had no friends, going to the Halloween party at Eric from Creep Records' house, where he met Eric, meeting Weston for the first time, How he became Crazy Tom Martin, Keeping Food in His Wallet, The Good Riddance Show, Tom Bigwig's last show with Felix Frump, Forming Throttle Jockey, Playing with Anal Cunt, The Flash Paper Story, Chris Gethard, and a shit ton more. Before we begin, I've been sponsored again by JVI Mobile Marketing, which has been a business since 2012, founded by former member of New Jersey pop punk band Red Rover and creator of the North Jersey pop punk Facebook group Jay Vix. He's been building a digital marketing agency that has grown to over 100 clients from all around the country. The agency specializes in all sorts of digital marketing for local small businesses. Whether you need a logo, website, automation, Facebook ads, or just more traffic and better rankings for your business, Jay and his team will work with you to find the best and most affordable solution. To learn more, contact JVI Mobile at 866-587-3837 or just visit www.jvimobile.com. A couple things before we start. If you have a cool story from the late 90s, please go to thiswasthescene.com and submit it there. Uh, so I want to add it to my blog. I've got a couple stories up there now. I got one from Scott Wyden Kivowitz, and I also have one from Jim Horwitz. Jim's I'll be putting up shortly, but Scott's is already up there. I also have a review from Danny from Jill, and Sean Bergen has a couple stories. So it's slowly building, but if you have any small recollection from back then, just a real funny snippet, it could be a paragraph, it could be really fucking long, just send it to me and send me some photos that I can add to the blog, and I will link back to you from the blog. It's just another way I can tell more stories about that time because I cannot interview fucking everybody, and I think this is just a, a cool way to get that out there. So again, please go to thiswasthescene.com, or you can email me at thiswasthescene at gmail.com. There's a couple ways you can help out this podcast. One, you could just go to the share button in your app you're listening through and get the link and text it to a friend and say, hey... I think you should check this out. This is a really cool episode. This guy, Mike, is doing this thing about punk rock, and you were part of punk rock, blah, blah, blah. You should listen to it. That's one way. You can also support the podcast by buying merch or just donating. Um, both ways can be found on the website. They're donating You can is at the top of the website, and the merch is in the store, the shop button. So you just go there. Um, I'm looking at do more designs because I think I'm very Jersey specific with the design, obviously because it's the state of New Jersey that says this was the scene in the middle of it. And I realized that there's people all over the country and now the world from what my stats are telling me that are listening to this. So I'll try to find some kind of neutral way to design some cool stuff. But if you have any suggestions, let me know. I'd love to, I don't know, get some ideas. And one last thing before I kick this off, I just like to give a shout out to the review by some kid 97. 
This guy I know, I don't, I don't, I, I don't understand what the fuck this means, but it says, this guy I know was almost complaining to me about how he's been reenacting World War II as a Russian twice as long as the war lasted. Lane Meyer was a band for five years. Here's to the future of this was the scene. Some kid. No idea what that means, but it's five stars, which is pretty great. So I will take that some kid. I doubt it was Chris Gethard. Maybe it was CT, his partner. Who knows? It's still a mystery. The mystery lives on. Feel free to subscribe, leave a review, and share this with anyone who would love some nostalgia. With that said, let's get started. Sorry about the confusion. I uh, I was editing tomorrow's podcast episode, and I was working on like two projects at the same time. And I look up, I was like, oh, fuck. Oh, no worries. I, uh, today's my day off, so I'm just kind of sitting in my basement where it's dark staring at the wall so this is perfect <laughs> before the craziness happens in my life in about 20 minutes with my kids <laughs> yeah what do you what do you do now because you, you've i follow your instagram you've got two boys i have three boys jesus wow that's amazing and uh i, I work within music so it's it's i'll get home at three o'clock in the morning and then my day just kind of goes by me and i go back to work what do you do <laughs> i work for Oh, really? Yeah. Wait, I saw the other day you posted what was – there was two bands you were in back then. It was Throttle Jockey and what was the other one? Because I saw that you you played a show. At yeah. Uh, our, the first – well, kind of the first one was Third Year Freshman. That's it. That yeah. was the – that's right. That was the first band. And then Throttle Jockey was kind of like a side project after that or during that? Throttle Jockey happened like after like Third Year Freshman. So it just turned into that. And I just had like whoever was around play with me in it. Okay. <laughs> which we'll get into <laughs> yeah so i think anyone listening i've mentioned tom's name on multiple episodes i think one of them there was a ton of them where i was talking about like my old band playing and he would yell play spindle when we were doing uh we used to do a ply united cover and this is like that's the way i remember it um and it was at wayne firehouse no i'm sorry it was the, the skaters world in wayne we played with you guys you guys were throttle jockey and we got up there and played and think you were friends with Alan and either you had seen us play Spindle or you had heard that we did and you like yelled it at us. And this is what I had remembered. But um, that's why, like, I think I told that story multiple times. And then we talked about you in Brian from Plow United's episode. Did you get a chance to listen to that one? I did. Brian doesn't remember anything about the past. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm ex- I'm, okay so i'm very excited to actually i hate how people every i think i've listened to so many episodes and podcasts lately and everyone's like really excited so excited and then i keep listening or i keep watching people on linkedin that do videos like hey everyone i'm really excited about this I'm like no one's that fucking excited i i'm just i'm thrilled <laughs> that we get a chance to talk because i uh, i hit my buddy john up john price and i said hey dude like who who should I interview? I'm trying to think of someone. He's like, you have to interview Tom. And he said this to me like a couple months ago. And I was like, I don't know if I can get him on. And then you just message. You're like, dude, I like the podcast. I was like, you should do this. You're like, okay. <laughs> so I'm pretty stoked. I, uh, I had knee surgery. I had a torn meniscus. So for two weeks, I sat in my recliner on painkillers listening to podcasts. And it was a time to reflect because I don't think about the past a lot. <laughs> I like to move forward. And I was just, I listened to the, uh, the Alex Sardi one, which I thought was great. And I saw him a couple of weeks ago and he doesn't know me and I punished him. (laughs) I was like, Hey man, nice podcast. He's like, who are you? (laughs) He was with Rob hit and I was just like, Hey, (laughs) holy shit. So that was good. Um, I'm very random. I don't introduce myself to people. I just go and say things to them. So (laughs) that was awesome. And then the one where I was like super medicated was with Josh from the Overdrives and not really being a fan of that band, but his story was really interesting and it made sense with his personality, how he wouldn't let people in, as he said. So I thought that was really interesting. Wow. (laughs) So I was like, Oh, like your podcast. (laughs) That's awesome. Yeah. I, uh, (laughs) <laughs> that's so funny that you like you just said it to alex and he was just like who are you yeah. are we, rec- are we is, is this recording now too is oh this, yeah this is, this, we, oh, we're, we're in it dude we are awesome we're f- fucking in it um so yeah that overdrive comment i'll leave in and 
<laughs> no, it's it's very factual. I was fascinated by this thing because like I follow them, but I was just I remember the overdrives like when Josh would do sound at the Catasauqua. Uh, I think it was like the American Caesarian Society in Allentown, and I just saw like the progression of his band and that hustle. So that was cool. That was that was very interesting in that. Yeah, I feel like um, the 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 backlog I have leading up to your interview are such interesting. I don't. It's like I just randomly did this, but um, the ones that are leading up to yours are so awesome. I feel like a lot of people there are just like people who are very i guess very honest in the scene so i feel like this is just gonna fall into it i don't know i just have this like feeling Um, it'll be honest (laughs) yeah so okay so we're about like we're just coming in um so what i want to do uh as you've kind of got the structure and everyone gets this is like go back in time go back to the very beginning talk about got you into music how it led to punk rock how that transitioned into like the music scene what you did cool stories that pop up and come to mind as you're talking um, especially as as many cool stories as possible. That's like my favorite part. And then we'll kind of like transition to like how the band broke up or how the two bands broke up. But to start off, yeah. So go back to like when to very little Tom Martin growing up and what song just got you into music and then what from there led you into like punk rock. All right. I discovered MTV in 1982. So I was like five maybe. Okay. And just started like listening to music from there and just being obsessed with it, but like only being obsessed by songs. I didn't really care like who the artist was. It was just very song driven. All I did was like just care about songs. And then I got a guitar at 12, terrible. I have no hand eye coordination. Like I'm left handed. I played right handed. It was just terrible. And just tried to like, I would just always try to write music and fail miserably. Uh, but, but there, you know, there was music around and I grew up in Michigan. So, oh, okay. I didn't know that. Yeah. I grew up in Michigan. So it was very hair metal oriented, like the Midwest at that time in like the mid late eighties. So like my first concert was like Bon Jovi and Skid Row at Joe Louis Arena. Oh, wow. And that, that definitely changed my life. It was just like big hair and smoke. <laughs> it was just like. This is awesome. And, I, you know, I love Skid Row and Bon Jovi was tolerable. Um, well, you said, though, you said that you didn't really listen to the music or watch the videos because you didn't care about the visual. You cared about the sound. But then you saw I cared live. about the sound of the songs. But then but I mean, that was early on. Like, you know, I mean, watching MTV, clearly I, I was into the videos, but like I wasn't artist based for a bit. It was just like songs like I like Men at Work. I liked Eddie Grant. Um Howard Jones, like all that stuff, like kind of like getting to the new wave, but like top 40 tears for fears. But yeah. I wouldn't buy tapes. You know what I mean? Like I just like would listen to songs. Well, you were five. <laughs> yeah, when I was five. No, you had a job or anything. <laughs> no. um, you know, I was just I would just, you know, wake up at seven o'clock in the morning and just like watch music videos and would just listen to songs. And my sister, probably like at 10, my sister is two years older than me, so or is two years older than me, I shouldn't say was, is. And so she was like super into Def Leppard. So I got into like that. That's when I started to get into bands. Um, but like just bad, like LA Guns, stuff I still like today, Tesla. That was such a larger than life world. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't very um it wasn't very relatable. <laughs> you know, like, that's a great way to put that. It was not <laughs> fucking relatable by any means. There, there was no one in my life with big hair and giant boobs. You know what I mean? Like <laughs> It, it was just like so it wasn't relatable but the songs like i like the ballads like in that time so i would just like try to write songs like that didn't happen and then probably probably in the seventh grade is when i wanted to be in a band and it just wasn't feasible but there was like people around me my age that were in bands and there was a kid in particular in my class named tim lampinen who was like he was a punk and he had like he had older brothers so he had, like descendants written on everything and he was in the misfits and the ramones and all that stuff but me just being into songs like it really didn't still only like kind of like being singular i didn't you know i was just like oh man like this dude's a skater he's into music but that kind of rubbed off on me later um, okay and he and he ended up being in like several bands uh big like in that early 2000s Detroit rock and roll scene. And, and again, being in the Midwest, everyone shredded. So a lot of like 
still trying to figure out like what I like. Like I was into like Steve Vai, but then I had Flood by the Might Be Giants, uh, the Dead Milkman, you know, which would be super important in my life later. Like Punk Rock Girl was a single, so I was into that. So it started just going up and down, you know, what I was listening to, but it was like very diverse. And I would probably like in eighth grade, I got into like Fishbone and like Faith No More and stuff like that. And I started listening to college radio and I would just tape everything. I still didn't buy like maybe full albums of stuff. I would just tape songs on the radio. Were you in, were you in, still in Michigan at this point? Or? I was in Michigan. Yeah. yeah. I, I moved, I moved to uh, Westchester in 1993 when I would just turn 16. Okay. What was that? What was that reason? Uh, my dad worked for the government. Okay. And my family is from West Philly. So they just, you know, their parents were dying and getting older. So we just went back to Pennsylvania. Were you part of the whole, like, because you said skating, like, I, I've interviewed a bunch of people that they were big into skating. Like, were you in that, like, whole scene? No. Like, no. No. I couldn't even tie my shoes. Like, <laughs> the, the skating was not, like, I, there's no fascination with skating with me. Um, I was so into music. Like, that was my thing. Like, I was into pro wrestling and music. I did not care about skating. Like, I thought, like, and I'm not into style. So for me, like, whatever was going on in the late 80s, early 90s, and the skating, I was just like, ah, oh, cool. They listen to cool music. I could I, I could give a shit about it. So, like, what kind of crowd did you hang out with when you got to... Because you said seventh grade, you wanted to start playing music, and then, but you were still yeah. in Michigan at that point. Yeah. And then 16, you got to... So what What between seventh grade and... Because seventh grade is what, like, 14? Thir- like 13, four- 14? Yeah, so you were, like, right at the verge of moving to Pennsylvania. So did you start anything out there, or did you wait until you came here? I made here. music in my in my in my bedroom. I had this thing I called puffball, which was bad. And then I and I had I had this other thing I did with like I had a friend like the the neighborhood the town I lived in in Michigan was called Novi, and it was like forty minutes from Detroit, so it was part of the a lot of uh, kids would come from the Japan with their families for the automotive business. So oh, yeah. I listened to a lot of J-pop, like nineties J-pop. There was this band X that I listened to, and I started playing. With, you know, in a band with this guy, Matt, and this guy named Toshia, who was from Japan, and he got me into a lot of Japanese music. So we did a lot of MIDI-based stuff with my crazy vocals. The tapes are weird. It's awesome. Um, what, what, like, kind of style, like, why was your style? Why are you saying it's weird, or was it weird? Well, my voice, my, va- my voice is, like, very abrasive, uh-huh. and... And at that point, like, Toshi would program everything on keyboard. So everything was MIDI. So it'd be like, it'd sound like a carnival. <laughs> like electronic music with me, like, trying to figure out the rhyme of things. And it was just bonkers. And I was, you know, you, when you're a teenager, it's, all these things go through your head. You're, yeah. you're trying to find yourself and all this stuff. So through this, like, we just started playing music. And I never played out, but I would just constantly trying to be in bands and it just did not work out so i moved july of like the second week of july in 1993 and prior to that my sister's friends finally took me to a show like that wasn't like a big arena we went to Lollapalooza 93 and that and that really opened my eyes on stuff like just like the community of it like alternative music was like you know, two years like removed from Nirvana, so it was just like bursting at the seams. So, so that was really good going to that. Yeah, what was that? That was like when Perry Farrell had like was he playing with Porno for Pirates in that, or was that Jane's Addiction, or was he even playing in, on that vent on that bill? Porno for Pirates put a record out that spring, but I don't know if they were on it. But it was like Primus, yeah, uh, Alice in Chains, Fishbone, like Nine Inch Dinosaur, uh, Dinosaur Junior was on it. Tool was on it. Rage Against the Machine was on it. Babes in Toyland. Uh, it was awesome. What like bands that were playing like stood out to you? Were like, oh my god, this this is fucking awesome. Probably Rage Against the Machine because it was like that record came out that winter, I believe, oh and this god. was like July. So seeing them like on a very small stage, the air of them like to me they were like though Rage is to me was a very calculated band. It was there was like that air of danger and tool same thing with tool like seeing them like on a small stage with like 
not a lot of people watching them. That was something. And there's a band from Chicago that played called the Cocktails. And they're like a jazz, like they're like a quartet. And I remember buying their seven inch and just being so excited. And then someone moshing and breaking it. And, and that kind of like, I was like, this is awesome. This is, you know, kind of like with, when I discovered like uh, Faith of More, like when I, when I saw Faith of More on Saturday Night Live and Fishbone, yeah. that's like when I decided I was going to do music for the rest of my life. Like it was just like these personalities and whether I was like, no matter what, I just wanted to be around personalities. So okay. that's kind of like how Lollapalooza was for me. Like, and then I moved like, so I was moving that week and I went to Ann Arbor with my friends and I remember, and this is kind of how it segues into punk because it was around, but there was really no one at that point like influencing me with it. So I was with my friend Slim and his sister were walking in Ann Arbor and this band was walking by. And for whatever reason, I thought it was the Mighty Mighty Boston's, but it was Shao and Pete from the uh, Bouncing Souls. They were, and I had no idea who they were. They're just like walking the street flying for a show, which was them, Lifetime, and Jack Kevorkian in the Suicide Machines. Jesus. And I had just gotten a, fly, a flyer, like, you know, at Lollapalooza about Jack Kevorkian in the Suicide Machines playing Scalapalooza at someone's house, whatever that was, Scalapalooza. So, you know, the week that I'm leaving, like, all this other culture comes to me. So I remember, like, talking to them, having this sticker, and then moving to Pennsylvania later on that week. And the first thing I did was when I went to Pennsylvania was go to Lollapalooza in Philadelphia. My mom's friend's daughter was going, so they took me. Okay. And that 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 was like more impressionable than you know Detroit because I ran into people who are like still my my friends. I met this guy named Pat Shannon who I was like in line with, who ended up being in a band called All Us Failed, and they were just him and his friends were just talking about like hardcore. And going to shows. And it was like a task to go to shows in Detroit because everything was 19 and over. So that really opened the gates, you know, in my mind, like that this was more attainable. Okay. Seventh grade, you were going, this. there's no way I can do this. I'm just going to make music in my room. But then going to Pennsylvania, you're like, I can actually play out. Yes. So the, the opportunities seemed like there was there's venues everywhere or places that you could play shows. And I wasn't even in Westchester. I was like, we were living in a hotel near the airport. So all this stuff is like in my brain, like, what am I going to do? And I just happened. I'm very like, I'm very awkward. Like my first impressions of people, I just, I go at them. Like, like you said, when like I'm yelling spindle, like that's, I did that for years. I go to shows and just yell, play that song. And people get so fucking confused. But that was me just like, well, everyone needs to breathe. I need to talk. You know, so I come at people very awkwardly. So wait, wait, like, wait, you're like doing that though. <laughs> wait, explain this some more. I'm so fascinated by this. It's like, <laughs> are you just uncomfortable and you need to fill like no, no, silence, or you're just I'm bored? bored? And then like, like nowadays, there's this, there's apps out there where it's like, um, you do things and you kind of, well, you'll walk into a coffee, like a Starbucks, and be like, can I get a free cup of coffee? And it, it, it's kind of like. This one guy did a TED talk about things. He's like, I got, I was so uncomfortable with things. I made myself more uncomfortable to become comfortable. Like, were, did you feel that way? Um, no, because I find humor in things and irony, and I get bored. And so I would just, you know, that was my way of expressing myself, like confusing the fucking singer in a band by yelling, "Play that song!" Like, th there's nothing better than going to a Fugazi show and. Me just sitting in the corner and watching people who have seen me do this yell at Ian and then him being confused and saying, shut the fuck up. Like, <laughs> you know, like, but I would go to shows and I would just yell it like and duck. And then they look around and go, what song do you want us to play? And so for me, that was like, and, and as someone that played in bands, like I, when I when I would play. I would engage in the audience and that was a deterrent to people. They couldn't understand why I would talk to them and yell at them on stage. But, but I, you know, it was, <laughs> it was me like, why am I just going to play these songs that I fucking wrote and mean nothing except for me in a time of need when I'm writing, you know, like, like writing to me is self-medicating. I know I'm going all over the place with this shit, but that's fine. You know, so to me, writing is like self-medicating. So when I'm on stage, I already wrote the song 
I know what it's about. You have no idea. So I'm going to talk to you. So that was just very awkward social interaction. So 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 we are, so now what? Okay. <laughs> I get it. This okay, like so, like when you your first show technically in Pennsylvania was Lollapalooza. Like, what was your first? So, what was your first local show, and then had that transition? You finally putting together a band. Well, you know, I didn't, I didn't know anybody other than Heather Latch, who I went to Lollapalooza with, and meeting like this guy Pat. And Pat had a drummer named Barry, and I gave Barry my phone and was like, "Call me. Like, I need to like, I, I was going to rebuild my life." I was set on it and I never heard back from my column. So like I had no friends for like July to like the school year and like September. So I just sat in my room and like recorded songs and would call college radio stations and tell them my name was Puffball and request songs. <laughs> and I would just be friends with these DJs. I had no friends. So when I went to school, me being like, fucking awkward did not help it like the school is like i seen the first like very like sports oriented which my school in michigan was like very sports oriented like i wrestled you know so i i like i knew i wasn't going to be friends with the athletes because these people in pennsylvania are not as nice as the people in michigan michigan people are very sweet i feel like the midwest compared to the east coast so i would like see people that look like they were in a punk or like, Hey, I'm in a band. And I give them like the puffball tapes and they'd be like, what the fuck? They thought I was fucking with them. Cause it was just so weird. And I was in, I was in 11th grade, but I was in a 10th grade science class. I was in special ed for 12 years. So like they just would put me through the system. Like I tested terribly. They just put me in classes and the grade scale was like harder in Pennsylvania. So there's like these two kind of like asshole dudes behind me named Connor and Jason, and they were super into hardcore. And I started talking to them, and they would go to shows every week. They'd go to like City Gardens in New Jersey, and they would go to the truck. And Jason came back with a black eye one day because he saw Life of Agony and skinheads like beat the shit out of him. He's like, dude, I got beat up at Life of Agony. I'm like, what the fuck? So I started hanging out with them, who became like my like closest friends like are still my close friends but they wouldn't take me to shows i'd be like hey take me to a show and they would just like i'd be waiting all night and they'd never come to pick me up i didn't realize they didn't drive <laughs> so whoever they were with and i couldn't drive because again the week before i moved to pennsylvania i got in a car accident uh so i destroyed my parents minivan the week before the week we were moving because i wasn't allowed to uh I took driver's Z, but everyone was scared to drive with me. So they let me take the test home and I memorized everything, but I didn't apply it to driving. So I didn't know when you make a left hand turn, you have to wait for the car to go. (laughs) (laughs) So I crashed my parents' car. So I couldn't drive anywhere. So I just had to wait. And the first show I went to was, uh, was rage against the machine, quicksand and stay the nation at the truck. Oh my God. Cause Cause, cause that was the show. I, it took me a while to lead up to that. I didn't remember this. Um, so leading up to that, uh, Raging Against the Machine played in Philly and that was during the whole fuck PMRC thing. So they came on stage naked and oh, I remember that they played the main stage and all you could hear was those dumb air horn guitars. Tom Morello, you're like, what? what? And they were naked. I'm like, this is fucking lame. Cause this is like the most dangerous band now. They like Guns N' Roses are like shit. Like, this band has a message. They're dangerous. So they, uh, if you had your Lollapalooza ticket stub, you could go see Rage Against the Machine at the truck. So this is like when Freedom was their single and stuff. So I went to that with a bunch of kids I met in my theater class who were like very normal looking, but were into some shit. And they would just go to shows every night. So I went to that rage show with them and then I met up with the people I met at Lollapalooza. So that was cool. And then seeing quicksand, like, like like now, like I'm watching like bands and and watching quicksand, like they changed my life. Yeah. Just like the, the intro to like phaser. I was like, Holy shit. And just seeing like how the East coast was, it was different than going to, you know, 
did you feel there was like more of a like a not like a stability but like a rawness or more more like realness to the music than the hair metal like yes shit? absolutely and and, that, and that's what i got into like prior to moving to pennsylvania like i was really into a band called big chief that was on sub pop that was from ann arbor and they were real their singer was barry hensler who's in the necros like so i was like i was into stuff like that and getting into like laughing hyenas and i was getting into like aggro stuff like no means no like it was changing from like when i knew i was moving i like i i was changing so mm-hmm. this this was the stop for it and there's a band called state of the nation that was from california and that watching them I was like just watching the interaction so so that show changed me. And then the next show I went to was Nirvana at the Armory during in utero. And by this time, like I was like it, Nirvana was so saturated. It was, you know, I was like, Oh cool. Like I can't be at home. Like, it, like I'm losing my mind at home. I don't know anybody. I'm pretty sure my parents thought I was going to kill myself. Cause I would just stay in my room and just, they didn't know what I was doing. Just like recording songs. And what, are you, what are you writing about when you're recording your songs? Isolation. <laughs> I mean, I was so isolated, you know, and, but they were like, I was, I was finding my rhythm and I was just sitting in my room every day after school and listening to college radio and just being influenced by whatever the DJs were playing. I still have the tapes of me calling in and them playing these songs. And every Saturday night, Villanova had this radio station and there's this guy named Gravy. Uh, I, I met him later and his name was great. His name was Chris. And he would, he would play like bouncing souls, 2.5 children who are like a local band. Um, he would play Sebado. He'd just play all these things. And like, I would just call him. Like I had no friends. I was lonely. I would just call him and talk to him. And on the radio, on the radio. Yeah. I would just call. And like, sometimes he'd put me on. Sometimes he wouldn't, but I would just talk to him on like, I just, I had no friends. I just call him that's when I was writing songs. I was just influenced by this just pot of stuff. So like, when did you finally put together? Like it was a third year freshman was the first band. Did you have a band before, before that, that? It was called Fondle and it was terrible, <laughs> but you know, I was like just meeting all these people. And if someone like to me, like th- this was like right before the whole green day thing. So it, punk was big. You know, like there, it was an underground thing. There, was, it was all around, but it wasn't as commercialized. It was going to be in a couple of months. So I would just find people that looked like they were into like like modern rock, you know, alternative music or punk, and just start talking to them and see if like we clicked. And I met this guy named Josh Camoli, who was very influential to me because he was the one person who just like he was teaching me shit. And before I met Josh, there was this guy named Jason who I met at lunch, and he took me to what I thought was... So this is, like, going back to, like, punk show. I thought he was taking me to, like, a local punk show. He took me to a church, and there was this Christian rock band called Black Cherry Soda, and I think he was trying to convert me. But there was, like, you know, like, it was the farthest thing that was going to happen. You know, like, like, I was like, holy shit, this is fucking weird. And there's like cover bands playing U2 and black cherry soda um, was good, but it was not, it's not what I was looking for. And I was listening to like stuff on like AMRAP and like alternative tentacles. Like my music was getting more aggro too. Cause based upon the stuff I was listening to going to see black cherry soda didn't work, but then I went and saw Nirvana and Nirvana, like the opening band, half Japanese. It's a band that I'd heard on the radio on college radio. So I got into them the breeders open and again that was like a bigger scale alternative rock show so moving forward i meet josh camoli and he like takes me under his wing and he's into anything that's punk like filth blats all the lookout stuff like plays me everything and tells me about how he goes to shows at this place called the corner and the corner ironically is like near my house now in downtown and it was like a farmer's market and there's a bingo hall where they set up shows. So he would tell me about all these bands and tell me about plow and Weston and local stuff, but it was so attainable. So Josh, you know, I guess, <laughs> and, and Josh went to a Halloween party 
and that's for him was like his big like like punk is awesome he went to a halloween party at eric victor's house <laughs> yeah eric talked so, about that it was the first creep records uh party yes, to get yes. bands to come there and check out the studio yeah so it was full circle and he's telling me about you know eric and like all these bands so i'm just like this is what i need to do and it took me a little bit to find eric <laughs> eric is a man of mystery um he is but, a man of mystery <laughs> You know, Josh just like took me under his wing. and was like, I'm starting a band. I'm like, I play guitar. So I had this red Charvel guitar, like, and we went to this guy Ben's house on Christmas break and started playing music. And there's this girl, Aaron, and her friend Mandy. And, and I guess played the drums. And we just started playing these songs. We wrote this song called I Want to Be a Gym Teacher, which is funny. It was terrible at the time. I'm like, well, I'm playing music. It's, it's, I'm not taking the lead on this. So I started doing fondle. And when we were there at this house, Aaron talked about her friend gravy. And that was the guy. And Aaron was younger than me. Like she'd go hang out at this radio station. So it all came full circle. Oh, wow. And I was like, I talked to this guy every Saturday. So I started playing with them and then I started going to shows. And there was this like, all ages nightclub near our house called breakers so like my friend jason he was in a band called prophecy they were a hardcore band so we'd go see them so i started going to see local bands because of josh and jason and connor and um they had this all day matinee which edgewise i believe maybe it was plow uh and weston and i'd never seen anything like weston before like, they were so funny. Yeah. And, you know, and the same thing everyone says about Weston, but, like, for me, it was just like, holy shit, this is it. And awkwardly, I went and talked to them. And you know who's more awkward than me? Dave and Chuck. <laughs> 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 and, you know, they embraced it. Like, and I, I mean, and I was out of my mind because I was just, like, repressed in every single way and going to the show not knowing anybody. And, like, they just, like, they gave me their seven inch. Like they gave me whatever was in their van. <laughs> I was like, can I buy a record? And they just started giving me shit. Wow. <laughs> just, just giving me random things. And which record was this on at this point? Uh, was it got beat which, up? Was what? what which, no, uh, this, they, yeah. they had a seven inch out. They, they had, um, it was the seven inch for snow. It came like, they put it out themselves, maybe like in 92 or 93. Oh, so this wow. was like, April of 94. So they didn't have any full lengths out. Oh, wow. I think, I think Teenage Rebellion had been recorded and Chris Benner, I think just left. So they had the shiny new guy, which we know is Jimmy. Um, yeah. <laughs> so Jim, it was right when Jim started playing with them and Jim didn't sing on any of the songs. It was, it was primarily Dave and Chuck and yeah. meeting them. Like, I think I started writing them letters and just like, telling them the progress of what was going on in my life. And like they just from that one encounter, that's what did it. And so I think I told them about my band Fondle and all this stuff. So they started going to more shows and uh, we played our, like we had a show in May and Josh is like, I know this guy, he's going to play drums with us. He's in the band plow. Well, our drummer was Joel who doesn't play drums and he he we went to his house for our first rehearsal and we he played on buckets <laughs> and joel probably was like 40 minutes his parents had from where i lived i was like we drove all this way to play in buckets <laughs> and he doesn't play drums and so <laughs> our first show was um no you know what joel didn't play our first show the first show was with was at the sp- corner which is now called the spotlight and it was like terrible like it was like a pay to play it's probably the only pay to play i've ever done in my life and uh there's these two guys named rob and kevin who ended up being a third year freshman they were in a funk band called teddy bear picnic and they played it was terrible and so the next show was with plow and fod and maybe the halflings and joel was our new drummer i met joel he had like the the buckets and that just started this craziness and 
you know, Joel, who I haven't talked to in some time, is like probably the most like influential person on me. Like he taught me how to do everything with music at the time. So, but Joel didn't know how to play drums. Wait, so, it just, wait so the, I thought Joel was in Plow. Joel was in Plow, but he ended up playing drums in Fondle. Okay. Um, okay. I mean, it was, it was, it, was it, it ended up being very incestuous. But this is before um, he was in Plow? Because he no, was playing he was in, in real, Plow. But he was on he a real drum set in Plow, though. Joel's the bass player in Plow. Joel's the songwriter oh, and bass player God in Plow. Oh, damn it. You're right. Yeah, we, we didn't get Sean. Trust me. Sean, we, we that's got, it. Okay. Yeah, we didn't Fuck. get Sean. We got Joel. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> All right, there we go. We didn't get, we didn't get the drummer. We got Joel. <laughs> we got Joel. <laughs> I love how like, like, I've done all these interviews and I know these names. And like <laughs> three months later, I'm like, who's that? I'm like, I literally talked to Brian for fucking almost two hours about this. So I'm so right. glad I forgot his name. But go on. So we played this show and it was the first time I'd played in front of people. And it seemed like a lot at the time. Oh, I can't wait to hear this. <laughs> And I'm like, I'm not nervous. Like, I, I don't get nervous when I play. Like, I feel like I should be doing this. But our singer, Josh, you know, like, he was he was very nervous. And the first show we played a couple weeks before, like, he was throwing up. You know, and there's no one there. And I remember, like, fuck. So we played. And so I'm not nervous, but I don't know what's going to happen on stage. Our bass player, our... <laughs> I don't know if our bass player knew how to play bass. It was he looked good, <laughs> and then maybe Joel didn't play. I don't. I don't know. Like my friends were playing drums. There's all these different people playing drums. Maybe Joel played a couple songs. Maybe Joel became in the band after it. I have no idea. But it was rough, and I thought people were making fun of me. So I'm like, I'm gonna fucking beat you up. And I started like this one guy focusing on. He had a Primus shirt. And I just started fucking yelling at him. My friends who were like into hardcore were like surrounding him. And no one no one ever saw me do this before. So they like they were really gonna beat him up because I was like just like chastising him and like and he was all he said was to his friends, and I read lips evidently, they fucking suck. And so then I targeted this other guy who has been a lifelong friend since then, but it took a while. <laughs> And I just started like, like we were going to beat him up. Like it was, it was some weird shit. I just, I was like, I, and I think I was insecure because of the singer. Like he might've thrown up on, like I might have thought he was going to throw up all over himself while we were playing. So I just started doing this thing where I started the crowd interaction and just like going at him. And it got really tense. That was the first time I used my powers on stage. <laughs> and, and, and it was very um, liberating. Let me tell you. And the guy that I ended up like yelling at was my lifelong friend, Mike Cummings, who a couple of weeks later was playing a show with his band at a park. It was plow and the boils. And I was like, fuck this guy. And plow. I don't think Mike knows this plow blasted their horn the whole time they were playing. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, a couple of years later, we became really close friends, but that's, that's when I like, I developed my stage persona, which leaked into my life and probably ruined my life because people didn't know how to read me. But, you know, then I was like committed to this character of crazy Tom Martin and just, you know, and Fonda, like we played five shows. They're all terrible. Um, Josh told me to call this guy who could help me because I was recording in my basement. That guy was Eric Victor. I talked to Eric for like three hours on the phone. Eric can make you feel real good. He should be like a psychiatrist. I don't know if he can like get himself out of a paper bag sometimes, but he, he is the best person to talk to. I talked to him every day on the phone. Like to this day, I talked to him every day on the phone. Oh no shit. That's awesome. And, but I talked to him and just talking about recording. And then I saw Eric's band at a battle of the bands. They were called, they were called reject. And then they turned into flaccid. So Fondle would play with Flaccid. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Eric, just very mysterious guy. I remember seeing him at the Dunkin' Donuts and we were recording with him the next day. And I was like, hey, man, are we still good for um, to record? And he just stared through me. And I was like, are we going to beat Eric? up?" And we weren't tough, but it's just like, what's up? We're going to record with this guy. And he just, yeah just what the fuck he just so he just ignored you 
or well, and, and you had been talking to him for like hours a day? Yeah, well, I I, I talked I talked to him for hours and we'd see him, but he was always just very he's very shy, and he's just like, yeah, how's it going? But he wouldn't even look at us. He was with his friends, who were very intimidating, and this was like probably like a couple months after I talked to him for a long time, but like he was just he was hard to communicate with. But I think it was just because he was very shy, and so we recorded with him and. Joel playing drums, like I think Joel played a guitar solo on the. It was just so weird, and that that was the final seven inch that came out on Creep. We broke up the day before we recorded as well. Oh Jesus! I remember seeing Josh the singer at it was Dog Eat Dog, The Bush Babies, Teddy Bear Picnic at the Trock, and this time like I was going to lots of shows, and Josh was like, "The band is broken up." I was like, "Thank God," because it just it was it was like cliched punk and that's not what i was into like i wasn't listening to like pop punk at the time so Um, you guys are so you literally were going into recording he's like we're done you're like thank god and then you show up and eric is the one who's recording all the creep bands and putting it on creep records and you're like hey as you're loading your stuff in by the way we're done but but that was eric's i mean that happened eric his whole career yeah he he talked about that a lot you know he'd be so excited (laughs) and then like Oh, by the way, we're we're breaking up. And then he put the record out and he put out the Fondle record. And, you know, when you're young, as you know, being like in a band, like there's there's no reference of time. You just want the fucker to come out. Yeah. And Eric was putting out tons of stuff at the time. And this was the worst of it. This was creep number five. And I remember like I was mad at Josh. We weren't talking. And like, cause he just, he did not understand my personality. So that was a big thing too. Like I was just so crazy. And like that dude was like passive and too punk. So, but you know, it was time to go our own ways. And I remember he went to college and he sent me the test pressing for the Fondle record and it skipped. So there was 500 Fondle records that skipped on side B. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, that was just a precursor <laughs> and, you know, but, but doing Fondle, like I just started writing songs on my own and that, that thing ended, it started in January, or maybe December of 93, ended in August of 94 that I was writing songs that would become third year freshmen. You know, Plow, Plow was the big band and Westchester is very small, but Plow would just play like every weekend and we'd go see them. And they took me under their wing. Eric, at one point, you know, I, I think Eric thought that, like, I was just, like, the hanger on her. But, of course, I was, because I was learning. Like, this is what I wanted to do. And those guys would just, you just get in their van and go places. And they would just teach me everything. I'd sit in Joel's kitchen, and he would just play me, like, the Smoking Popes. He'd play me Septic Death. He would just, he played me, like, Chumbawamba, like, you know, pre-pop Chumbawamba. Just play me all these different kinds of music. So now Joel is, like, my radio station. I didn't have to call the radio station. I would just go to his house and he'd play me records and, and, and teach me what he knew of the business. And, and he was like, I would sit, I'd give him these demos, what would end up being a third year freshman, like, uh, and he was very supportive of it. So my sister went to Westchester university and she's like, I need to set up a show. So I got, Plow, Teddy Bear Picnic, who ended up the guys that were in third year freshman. Uh, the Boyles played, I believe. Bug Light played. Who? Bug Light, I don't know if you're there on Creep. They put out a split with the Bouncing Souls. They're a very underrated band that went to One Foot Records eventually, but like they were awesome. Like just put on the show at Westchester, and that was the debut of third year freshman. And again, that was like, now I'm singing. No one knows what the fuck is going on. This is awesome. (laughs) And and at this time, I started putting food in my wallet. That was my icebreaker, like how I would yell stuff at shows. When I would meet people and they were not, I was pretty certain they were unsure of me, I would like offer them meat from my wallet. Like I'd put sandwiches in it. And it, it would like either they would get it or they would like punch me in the face. I think someone talked about that in one of these episodes, how you were like, you pulled chicken nuggets out of your wallet. I'd pull anything out that I could find. Yeah, someone, fuck, I have to remember which interview that it's was. Probably, it was probably Brian. It might Brian. have been Brian or Eric. I mean, like, it was someone, actually, no, I think it was Chuck. 
Okay. It ha- it's like some. It had to be someone who is from the Westchester, like the pencil, like the Philly area, Pennsylvania area. Um, but <laughs> it's just so funny to because like from their perspective, it was what you wanted to get from them, and they got it. They were like, w- "What the fuck is happening right now?" But or it was just like that was just Tom. But from your perspective, it was like calculated, very calculated. And that's what I find so interesting about this because. Everything you did was very calculated. Very calculated. To this day, everything I do is calculated. And I don't think people think – I don't think anyone gets that. No, but, like, I grew up on, like, two things, music and pro wrestling. And there's there's characters. I just listened to a podcast the other – like, yesterday, and they were talking about the rapper Lil Peep and his correlation of how it's, like, the same thing, you know, music and wrestling, like, building a character. And it was. And, like, I committed to it, like, to a fault. Yeah, you did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was like, all right, I'm all in. And, you know, in my professional life, it's really hard because all I deal is with musicians and I have to be like so straight. And, you know, that weird side comes out sometimes. It comes up more with rappers than anything because I feel like their their world is what the fuck. So I can add it. But, you know, it's just always been a part of me, like, you know, in 93, when I committed to this character to 2019, and that's a very long time to commit to something. <laughs> and that's what was so confusing to me, because when I went to your Instagram, it's like, here I am with my sons. I'm like, this guy's got fucking kids? <laughs> I'm like, and he looks like he's such a good dad. He like, he's like, loves his kids. I'm like, I have no clue who this motherfucker is. <laughs> but that's, you know, that's like my life is separated, but but it's not like I've been with my wife for 19 years oh, wow. and, and we're not, we're, we're like totally like the opposite people. When I met her, she had a fucking Bible in her hand and a dress down to her toes. And I was like hung over on 12 long Island iced teas from the night before. You know, I'm like <laughs> we're, 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 we're completely. She's like, uh, yeah, that guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah but that's great but again like i met her through fucking with her you know like that's mm. like you know <laughs> like i met her at at, a, at work and they're like don't talk to sarah like she's super proper and religious don't open your mouth and i was like i'm gonna open my mouth and same shit like what's your name tom oh what do you what do you do i was like and i worked at a cvs oh i you know i stock tampons on the shelf do you like music she didn't like music she didn't know much about music i basically i told her i was like you know i'm looking to get in a relationship like my goal is to have a kid and i was like maybe 21 and that's that how that happened of just fucking with someone that's how i met her um that you gave her some chicken nuggets from your wallet (laughs) later on (laughs) but but you know that's like just very, very calculated but like it's not like a front like this is just my personality and I always thought, like, well, playing music, like, you have to be a character. Yeah. And, and you know that. Like, look at Patty from Dillinger 4. Yeah. Like, that guy. And, you know, not, like, to totally get off this timeline, but, like, I remember Jim Capozzi. You know Jim, right? Uh, Jim set up shows in New Jersey. Like, Yes. Kind of uh, shit. I'm, it's like, and the name is ringing a bell. I'm just not 100%. He, he set up shows in North Jersey. And I remember he booked, um, Dillinger four and throttle jockey. And he was like, you have to meet this guy, Patty. And I'm like, we're probably not going to like each other. (laughs) Like, like, like our personalities are like too big. And then Patty met me. and was like, (laughs) you know, and, and his personality like trumped mine. So, I mean, he would get completely naked on stage. Yes. Yeah. That, 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 I wasn't so there were certain things that you wouldn't do I couldn't do that I was not I was not happy with my penis so (laughs) that 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 wasn't gonna be a thing like that shit no one saw that shit like you were if we were on a date you weren't gonna see that shit um (laughs) that shit that wasn't gonna happen um but you know so third year freshman like we were under the wing of plow plow took us to everything like we they would just take us to shows and 
you know, th- I know this is very like this podcast is very oriented like in New Jersey, and that's you know how I met Alan Rappaport, and Alan, I think is very underrated. Oh yeah. In what he and what he did, I mean, he 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 was very important to me because like he again I would call him. Joel's like, and I didn't have any records. I was like, you need to call this guy, and I'd call Alan and I'd send him my demo tapes. I first met Alan probably like April of '95. Remember this very vividly. I had gotten into a fight with my parents about college because again I was in the special ed system for years and like I barely graduated because that's I didn't give a fuck. You know, yeah. wanted to play music. And I couldn't, I didn't know how to, I couldn't learn. So <laughs> I remember like leaving my house cause they were like mad because I wouldn't go to college on a scholarship for special. Right. I was like, I've been like, like cursed with this shit all my life. Now you want me to go to college with it <laughs> so I can just go to school. Fuck this. I'm going to go play music. I remember like walking and I probably live like it's, it's probably like a 30 minute walk from my house to like the center of Westchester. I walked there and Plow was going to play a show in Jersey. I think that was with Weston. And they took me in their van and just, and I went. And then I saw North Jersey, which was a totally different world than like Philadelphia and Westchester. Which part of North Jersey? Did you go to Allen's house in Wayne or did you go to like the flip side or? Um, it, it was a hall. Oh, okay. Um, wasn't the Wayne Fire Hall, but like, and I've been trying to research this, but like I can't find it. It was either probably like Booton or West Orange. Was it like big or small? Uh, small, I guess. Okay. I mean, and uh, the yeah. band Stinkhole played, and I just remember like seeing like that, you know, that community of North Jersey. Man, North Jersey was awesome. The stuff that Alan was doing was great. Yeah. You know, and listening to your interview with him, just like. I remember going to Flipside and just buying all these records from him. And I'd call him regularly and like, what's cool? Not knowing too that Alan, like, you know, he, he was talking to all the distributors. So like <laughs> he was a salesman, you know, but I didn't live in Jersey. So I would just go somewhere else and buy these records. And, you know, he would like, he was very, no, you know, I think I met him in North Jersey and then true zero played at this place called the harmony Grange, which was like an outside park where they put on shows. And that's, that's when I started like a rapport with him. But you know, third year freshman because of Plow Lake, and we were still in high school. Like we play, we'd go to Lancaster, you know, and Sleepasaurus would play with Plow and Dutch Land Diesel. They wouldn't tell anyone we were playing. They just like, hey, there's this band, they're gonna play, and we were a, a fretless bass, acoustic guitar, and a snare drum, so we could go anywhere. And they would set us up before they went on. We were the freak show, and we'd play, <laughs> and you know, we'd go to Allentown. And, and play shows there. And there's this guy, Andre Cahill, Khalil, and he would set up shows at the uh, American Caesarean Society. And, you know, we played with Bracket. And same thing, like, we'd play all these shows because, like, we didn't have gear. we just get my Cutlass and drive. So we'd do Allentown. We'd play, like, in Maryland. We'd play in Lancaster. We'd play in North Jersey. And then uh, Josh mentioned... Josh mentioned in his from the overdrive St. Mary's, Pennsylvania. That was like a hotbed. They were so repressed. What do you mean? They had nothing in St. Mary's. So you had oh. bands play like a band, like the beatnik termites would play in, in St. Mary's and they were like rock stars. Sorry. My son is texting me. He likes to uh, guilt me. He always love you. Come visit us later. <laughs> <laughs> I'm busy. See you someday. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> what? What he, was he like, like me? He, <laughs> I know that sounds fantastic. Um, what? Uh, what was like the your reception like from people? Like, did you notice that you were getting a following? Yes, but it was very split because again, like, there was heat from me. Like, people didn't know what to think of me. Like, we pl- third year freshman played. This is like. May of 95, we played, uh, my sister again, like, it's like, Hey, I need to set up a benefit, put on a show. So plow the boil super high five, which is Eric's band, um, played. <laughs> Sorry. I have to laugh at this one. Cause we were talking about this not too long ago. We played outside at Westchester and third year freshman plays and nothing but shit came out of my mouth. It was fucking bad. And so 
bunch of these big dudes with mohawks came on, and I was convinced that they were the Westchester male volleyball team. <laughs> and and they're like shaking their head at me, like this guy fucking sucks. And I was like, fuck you. No one goes out to watch volleyball. And it turns out that it was like the uh, the Westchester University Golden Rams uh, football team. Oh god. And they like. I go off the stage and start like yelling at them. And my sister comes in when she sees them chasing me, like chasing me. And then they grab me <laughs> and they're trying to fight me. And I'm just like, I'm not afraid of you. Fuck you. No one likes volleyball. And then I think like a couple of months ago, we were discussing it. And I was like, remember the volleyball team? She's like, they were the football team and they were going to kill you. <laughs> and, and, and that, you know, that was our thing. Like people could like, you know, like kids could relate to the people that were into punk and punk was hot at the point, but the outside person did not know what was going on. Every story you've said so far when you're on stage, it's always like mentioned you wanted to fight people. Like, did you, was that people part got of that? I didn't know. Uh, okay. Just, like, did you, it was, it was yeah. just like confrontation. When you talk to someone out of turn that in return is confrontation. Okay. Like if you speak to someone that doesn't want to be talking, spoken to, that's confrontation. And I was bored. I was like, again, I was playing these songs and I'd see someone and be like, Hey man, you like, um, you like screeching weasel. They kind of suck. So do the Ramones. And then I just go through the lookout catalog. So do the queers. Um, so does the Mr. T experience and just go through all these things on stage and the, on stage. <laughs> and I was just bored. And the, like Rob and Kevin that were playing with me in third year freshman, like they were so mad at me because they were like trained musicians. I would piss them off because they just wanted to play. Right. And they're essentially doing me a favor, but cause like they wanted to play and I got shows. So they played with me, but they were trained. I was not. And I would just, they would get so bummed out. And they were like in the 11th grade and like, man, like we just want to play. Like, why are you yelling at people? And they didn't get it. Cause the joke was on them too. Like, <laughs> you know, like they didn't know what was going on. <laughs> so I didn't want to fight anyone. I would just end up fighting people because people get so mad. And so third year freshman, like we did that for two years, Rob, like Kevin, the bass player quit because we were going to play in Pompton lakes. Actually, I don't even know if we were going to play in Pompton lakes. We stayed at Alan's house for a couple of days. <laughs> I, like, because we played in St. Mary's. We played with Good Riddance in St. Mary's. This is a funny story. We show up, <laughs> and uh, this girl, Monica Pasquinelli, booked the show. So we drove, like, five, four or five hours to go to Western Pennsylvania. She sees what it is, and she goes, can you guys play in the parking lot? I was like, excuse me? She's like, well, you know, a mock is going on, then Good Riddance, and do you think that you could just play in the parking lot? I was like... You booked us to play the show. Why, why would we play in the parking lot? And so then I'd be, I, had to, I had to learn how to be my own advocate. Because no one knew, like it was so novel, like not a full band, just like a snare, a bass, and a guitar. I was like, why would we drive for five hours and play in the parking lot? <laughs> so, you know, we played on the stage. But I, I was so confused of why like we would come that way and just play in the parking lot. There's no one in the parking lot. There's not a show in the parking lot. But third year freshman, I guess that was the second stage. <laughs> the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, because every, every local show was set up like a fucking festival. There was the yeah. main stage and then the second stage. But but there was no one in the parking lot. She just wanted us to play outside. Like, that was that was the energy. Like Because she just didn't want you to be in the on the show? Or did she actually think that was going to yeah, be? Yeah, she booked us on the show, but for whatever reason, wanted us to play outside. I still don't understand what the logic was of that, but I was like, fuck you. We're playing with good riddance. <laughs> you know? Was the show and, pretty big? Was the show inside pretty big? It was inside. It was in a VFW hall. <laughs> good riddance played a VFW. What year was this? 97? 95. 95. 95. Oh, wow. So, this is still so early on. All, all, those, all those fat bands played halls. Like, it was big on the, you know, it was big out west, but it was still like getting traction and we're a year removed from green day. So they're still like, it's not. Yeah. in your face yet. And, and you're playing a place like St. Mary's. Like there's the sheets on the street, the, you know, there's like a gas station, a convenience store. There's nothing else. So those bands would kill in those towns. 
a band called Felix Front played, which, you know, I mean, I think it was, I think it was Dog Pound and Felix Front. Do you do you know Dog Pound? Yeah, I remember. I got. <laughs> I remember getting their CD when I first got introduced to punk, and I went and played a show and bought it. And I wasn't really. I mean, I don't even remember what it sounded like. I wasn't a fan of it because I think it was more hard hardcore, or like harder you know punk rock. I don't think anyone was a fan of it. It was weird, but they had a label called Black Black Pumpkin. They put stuff out, and like yeah. they were really nice guys. But it was bad. I think it was Dog Pound and Felix Frump, and Felix Frump had Tom from Bigwig in it at the yeah. time, and they sent him home that night. Like they kicked him out of the band. I want to say in my mind that he went home on a Greyhound bus from St. Mary's back to like whatever New Jersey he, he was did. From. He he talks about it in his interview. Yeah, yeah. So. And and I and Tom again, he's another person who has a very interesting personality. So years later, like three years ago, I'm settling a screeching weasel show with Bigwig playing, and I don't have much conversation except when I'm paying him at the end of the night. I'm like, remember that time Felix Front sent you home on a bus? <laughs> <laughs> like again, my social skills, <laughs> and 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 you know, he's just yeah, man. <laughs> Um, I gotta go now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, he did the North Jersey thing where they blow you off. Yeah, <laughs> just like, but you know, I didn't tell him who I was. I don't think he knows me. <laughs> <You> know, <laughs> well, I know but he I ha- had to do it. I know he has listened to the. He was listening to the podcast when it first started. I mean, some people like will trail off a bit, so he might still be listening. <laughs> he might hear this this interview. <laughs> but you know, I I remember that. I'm like, oh shit! Like, and they had um. They were in one of those little, like, short school buses, the uh, Felix Trump. And I remember that being like, man, this band is terrible, too. Like, they listen to the Descendants like they're bad. And I could see that Tom, like, had potential because, like, he owned it, but it wasn't his band. So that was interesting to see um, that. But then we went to Pompton Lakes and hung out with Alan, and it was just like... You know, that, again, that was, like, another big thing, going to Flipside and just picking his brain and we did we did third year freshman probably for like another year it broke up in 1996 but on alan's podcast you were talking about that less than jake show third year freshman played that oh in the backyard backyard. we played that oh my god did you like less than jake did you like them when you no absolutely not okay um i was a big suicide machines fan again being very singular i can only like one band per genre so (laughs) Jack of Orc and the Suicide Machines were my local band in Michigan. They were my plow, mm. you know. So I had like all the Jack of Orc demo tapes, and prior to them, you know, signing to a major and stuff. So like, that was my one ska band. But I did not like Less Than Jake. Um, it's ironic now, just because uh, Matt Drastic. I don't know if you know Matt. Matt's now the drummer in Less Than Jake. He's their manager also. He's another one. He was in a band called Jake and the Stiffs. He got like. He was another early supporter in Westchester of like, you know, my band and stuff. Now he plays drums with them. So I go see Less Than Jake fairly frequently now. But like at the time, it was just not a thing. Like they were always playing. It was very saturated. I don't like horns. I think like I played trumpet, but I don't like horns in bands necessarily unless it's funk metal. So <laughs> Less Than Jake, I, I just think it was like oversaturation. I wouldn't have liked them until maybe like their Warner Records in the early 2000s. But oh, wow. it. I just wasn't into it, but I remember like everyone came out of the woodwork for that show, trying yeah. to get signed to feel by ramen and, and people in North Jersey were very thirsty. Like I'm not thirsty. I'm hungry, <laughs> you know? So I'm not going to go and like, you know, nibble on someone's ear so they can hear my band. And I remember everyone came out of the woodwork for that, trying to get on feel by ramen. And that was, I just remember like, it was like a line. I felt like everyone was going to like Roger and Vinny and like trying to get their attention. And third year freshman was a wreck. We had like a new drummer and a new guitar player. And we had a guitar player. It was just like, we just played. I was our friend and that was a good show for us, you know? But like, I, that's how I was introduced to big wig. Cause I remember meeting Josh from big wig and he was very business minded. And like, you know, they got everything they wanted. Like they, they were very calculated, like in a business end, but like, that's not where I came from. Yeah. I liked the business, but like, I didn't, I didn't want to be on a cassette tape in a fucking Chinese container. You know, that was like the big thing. Those fuel by ramen things. Like same thing with like, 
I know you did a podcast with Boxcar. Like those guys were awesome, but they were very business minded. They wanted to be people's friends. I didn't want to be people's friends. I didn't want to network. Like I had my foundation. I just wanted to keep playing. And, you know, so North Jersey is always a thing when like everyone would come out like network. <laughs> How did you feel like it was working out for you? Like, because you were like, you said before you weren't thirsty, you were hungry. You just wanted to like, where did you want to go with it? Uh, to the next, to the next town. There was no, in like now, like everyone has a business plan. Like you, you have a business plan before you're even in a band, you know, like then it was just like, it, it really like writing songs, like coped my anxiety just of being like in a new, like, you know, being new to Pennsylvania and stuff. And like, just my awkwardness, like I just wanted to write songs. So all I wanted to do was write songs and perform. So I put those things together. So I never thought like, I just, that's, I just wanted to do something with music and perform. Did you ever feel like what, at what point between playing a show and finishing a show and going home or whatever, like, did you kind of, did you ever have like a second to yourself going like in your mind, just knowing how you just were creating this persona or playing where you thought to yourself, like you got that anxiety relief or you got that fuck yeah I'm, I'm i feel like this high from doing this like right now oh yeah this. yeah the the second third year freshman show was um i know i'm talking a lot but sorry i'm reflecting you're you're making me reflect um the whole the, point do podcasts can go on show. and on and on like this isn't yeah. like a fucking cd where you have to cap yeah. it uh the there was this place in delaware that plowed book shows called the barn door it was a fucking bar where they let teenagers like in the liquor laws in delaware which i've learned much later like are so lax they're not they're not controlled by the liquor control board we well, need some LCB. reason to fucking go to delaware so <laughs> yeah i mean and i i live 12 miles from delaware it is like a fucking like it's like it is a different world yeah it it is fucking bizarre have you ever th- lane meyer played in delaware right uh i'm not sure but my dad used to live in middletown for okay a very long time Middletown's weird. Um, yeah, it's just like like Newcastle courses. County. Uh, it was like, like right right over the border from Chesapeake Bay City. Okay. Yeah. Um, but fucking nothing you there. Know, we'd play shows there. in. Yeah. There's nothing. We yeah. play shows in Delaware, and this barn, this bar called the Barn Door, like there was just teenagers, you know, just going to this bar. Oh my God! Hold on, sorry. Oh, your kid again? Hey, I'm in the middle of doing a podcast. You can you? Uh, that's why I'm texting you via text. Bye. Is that good? <laughs> <laughs> no one listens to me. You know, I should have put the sign. Leave me the fuck alone. I need one of those Uncle Jesse lights where you can't go down the basement like in a Full House because Jesse and the Rippers were rehearsing. Yeah, the red light. That was I'm talking. I need the red. I need the red light. Um, so. <laughs> We played the barn door with the Halflings, who are like another like great Westchester band, and uh, Jake and the Stiffs. And again, like Matt, Matt Drastic, Matt Yonker just put us on the show, and that's when I saw it. Like I controlled the crowd, I commanded it. You know, and it, it wasn't like an ego thing. It was just like, man, like, because the whole thing of punk and doing this shit is community and like a sense of like gratification, self gratification, whatever. So like. Doing that, like, that was it. That was the time I was like, fuck this. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to ruin my life. And I did. Hmm. <laughs> you know, like, through the sickness of music, you know, like, that's that, that was the time where I knew. Like, I had, like, a sense of self-worth. Interesting. So, like, every time you'd get up and play, just you... It almost sounded like when you came from Michigan, you were like trying to figure things out. You started playing music. And then when you went to shows, you were like, this is the crowd I want to be around. But then you took it to the next level because you were like, I'm going to kind of just stick out. Yes. And then it leads to you playing in a band and there's the other guy singing. You're like, okay, I'm not sticking out yet. And then it like, it just put you in like, it's like the scene and then like the front of it, but just for your own pleasure or music. Yeah. I mean, just. Yeah, I was bored. And <laughs> it it sucks, too, because, like, there is a responsibility when you play music. And my my values are just like, never be shitty. You know, like, don't don't be a shithead to people. Like, don't use this opportunity for other stuff. So I was always very self-conscious, like, with how I, like, <laughs> I'd make you want to fight me. <laughs> 
and but as I was, I thought I was being nice to people at times, but it, it turns out like people just didn't know how to read me. But like I had this, we wrote this song called Satan Girl, and it was a third year freshman song. And there's this girl named Jen who's a freshman and I was a senior. And the first day of school, she wore a fucking pentagram necklace and looked like a witch. So, you know, for me, music's also social commentary. And I would play every day my guitar in the art cl- in the art room. And so to her face, I would like, you know, play Satan Girl. And then I'd sell tapes in school. I made a lot of money in high school selling tapes. Really? Yeah, I got beat up. The, the thing with third year freshman was this dude, Zach, was sitting at the lunch table and I look, I had a, my eye was very, had astigmatism, was very weak. So I was cross-eyed. And I looked at him the wrong way. And he said something to me. And all I said was like, fuck your grandmother. <laughs> 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 and he beat the fuck out of me. And like, grabbed, put his book bag around my neck. And like, literally dragged me across the lunchroom. And I started trying to fight him. And that... I got respect from people because like I tried to fight this dude who was like on fucking steroids in the 10th grade. He was a third year freshman. So then I came up with the name third year freshman. And then I wrote a song called Zach because of him. What I didn't realize we were in the same science class. (laughs) And so we're like, and we didn't get suspended. We just go in the class. I'm like, fuck. So I sold him a third year freshman tape. That's how dumb he was. Oh man. Like, I don't even know where I'm at with this, but that's, that's, Oh, I was talking about, I was, hold on, sorry. Yeah, yeah. About Satan Girl. So Jen hey, Ralphus, I would write, I wrote this song about this girl, Jen, who I didn't know, who's like very young freshman, but it's like, don't come to school your first day and look like a witch. So then I would like sell these songs. So then Satan Girl and people like made fun of her and I probably wasn't very nice to her. And I, I just remember like her being very mad at me and then seeing her like probably like five years later on a train, I was coming from a, uh, I think it was like Sam I am Weston at the Rotunda in Philly or the 4040 in Philly. And we were on the train. She goes, you know, you ruined my life. Like my first day of high school, you made fun of me. I was a fragile flower and you took that away from me. And I, 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 and I was crushed. I was like, you know what? Hands up. (laughs) Like, like that's not what I intended. When did she tell you this? This was probably like five years after. So this was like 2000 oh. when I was like taking a train home. Oh, wow. And she's like, you ruined my life. I was a fragile flower. Oh, man. And I was like, to be fair, you shouldn't have dressed like that. <laughs> and then she cast a spell but, on But you. that really, yeah. But the song was like, you know, I just, and I always wrote about just like what I saw. Mm-hmm. You know, like in Throttle Jockey, every song was about the town Dowingtown. I hated the people in Dowingtown. I uh, I hated the, the, the girls I was writing about in downtown. I hated it. And guess who owns a fucking house in downtown? Me. Like, <laughs> I live in downtown now. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like, what the fuck? But I always just wrote about socially. So for me, everything is very localized. I, I was always doing things about the time. I didn't, I wasn't worried about what my future was. And all I wanted to do was what I was doing at that time. So when did like you know, third year I, freshmen officially like break up and then like, or were you doing throttle jockey at the same time and in transition? No, th- uh, third year freshman broke up in July of 96 at a, at a house in Indiana. We did a tour. Like we played a lot, but I was like, Oh fuck, let's go out for three weeks. Our drummer had quit. Cause you know, he was getting ready for college. He was going to be a senior in high school. And I was crazy. And so I got Doug and Ryan from the Halflings and our bass player, Matt. We did a tour because I, I put out a record. So Rob quit when I put the record out. So I was like, we have to do this tour. And, you know, we took out this girl, Monica. Monica, I don't know why she came. She was selling merch for us. She was the one who told me to play in the parking lot in St. Mary's a year prior. So that probably wasn't a good idea. <laughs> My logic. So, you know, we played like did the Western Pennsylvania thing, played in Michigan, like played, you know, like my friends in Michigan came, played a show in Grand Rapids at this place called the Reptilian House that it's the thing of like pre-internet, you show up, the doors are locked, you were never booked. Yeah. The guy opened it and we played to my five friends from Michigan. We played, we played in Minnesota 
in Fairmont, Minnesota, which had a really nice, weird scene. Uh, we played with Strung Out and Diesel Boy on a lake. Holy shit. And that's when I realized that, um, you know, the fat record bands are like businessmen with fucking pink hair. Um, you know, we did that and we broke up because our drummer, um, sorry, my wife wants to have an iced coffee. Please, iced coffee, mocha. All right. So, you know, it just, I didn't like the people I was playing with. I, I hate, I hate to travel, honestly. Like, I always slept in the van, like, no matter what. I didn't want to be around people. Just part of the isolation, you know? Play music, do your thing. I didn't want to be around people. So it just didn't work out. And I didn't like those guys very much. And Matt, our bass player, was just like growing up. He was outgrowing what we were doing. So we broke up um, at this like frat house, like house show in Indiana. How, how did that happen? Like, what, did that, our, what was that like? Oh, it was amazing. Our drummer went to put this, like, the cinder block on his kick drum. And the nail went in his hand, and he's like, I haven't had a tetanus shot! And starts crying. And he had to call his dad to see when he was getting a tetanus shot. I was like, fuck this. I was like, this is it. I'm done. <laughs> I, like, like, this is not what I want. I don't even want a full band. Like, I just wanted the snare drum. I want it to be the way it was. So, you know, the second version of Third Refreshment was fucking terrible. And I just, that was it. We drove home. I started writing these songs about how I hate this town called Downingtown and the people that I played with. And that ended up being throttle jockey and put an ad at the record store that Joel worked at CDs to go. I was just like, need a <laughs> looking for a drummer. And so I met this guy, Kevin Olds through Joel. And then uh, there's a band called Bernie, Bernie head flap and their guitar, their singer, Alan was an amazing guitar player. He played guitar. And then I needed a bass player. So Brian McGee was our bass player. Where was Brian living? Because down... And so now, were you in Westchester at this time? I was in Westchester. Eric okay. lived in Downingtown. And Joel Joel lived in Westchester. And Brian probably still lived in Aston. I don't think he moved to Eric's yet. Okay. I know Westchester pretty well. My family's from Malvern. Like my stepmom okay. family. Um, actually, this, I don't have to keep this in the, the uh, podcast. But I actually text my, my cousin... Did you ever go to the um, the Flying Pig? It's a bar. I, attempt, I attempted to do open mic nights at the Flying Pig. It didn't work out too well. With recently, <laughs> or was this like back then? Like in the in the two thousands. Oh wow, it's a cool. That's a tiny little spot. I can't imagine that crowd though. I could see why it didn't work out because that crowd there doesn't yeah. seem like it'd be very into. Uh, it's a it's a cool bar. Disruption. I mean, it Malvern. I mean, dude, like. The band The Explosion, they came out of Malvern. Did they really? Uh, oh, yeah. Matt and like Damon are from Malvern. I did um, not know that. Yeah. Like, Malvern, like, I mean, I lived in West Goshen, which was like right, like a skip from Malvern, but that was such an isolated world. Like, all those d- guys were into like hardcore, and like those two, like, those two guys were from Malvern. Like, and Malvern is like a strip. It's not yeah. really a town. No. I got, pull- yeah. I got, I got pulled over in Malvern about, seven years ago i sold fertilizer for 10 years i would go door to door and ask people if they wanted a free lawn application and i decided in between jobs i'd go in the middle of the night and go like throw like lawn pamphlets on people's driveways and there's like seven malvern police pulled me over because i was eating a peanut butter sandwich at four o'clock in the morning and they thought i was gonna rob a house (laughs) like you're never welcome to malvern again i was like dude i'm gonna have a baby in a couple of days i gotta get work done (laughs) They're like, we don't think you're doing this. Like, look at my fucking car. I had 20, I probably had like 2,000 pamphlets in my back seat. I was like, I'm not robbing anybody. Why are you doing this? I was like, because I need to get my work done. And I'm a vampire. I don't do this during the day. So that was the last time I was in Malvern. <laughs> so, okay. So um, there was a story I was going to break up before. Um, <laughs> my buddy Bob said there was one time he was at a show. I think, again, there's a lot of stories that I've said through these interviews where my friends hit me up afterwards they're like you fucking got it wrong it was this so but he goes there was a show that i think he was at and i think it was a throttle jockey show and you were like again it was like a fight thing when these guys were fuck with you you were like fuck this you're like i'm getting on my super or like it was like your wrestling gear or like some kind of outfit and you took off and everyone sat around like laughing thinking you were joking and you came back like in the actual outfit to fight them 
Do you remember this? It possibly could have happened. I but, mean, but that's something you did because I think he said it was like a. I thought he said a wrestling. Was it like outfit. wrestling headgear? Yeah. Yeah, my. You're like I need to get my wrestling headgear, and you ran and got it and came back, and you're yes. like, okay, now I'm ready. I had wrestling headgear. Like that's actually like how Chuck. He had wrestling headgear. I gave him my wrestling headgear. I passed the torch to Chuck. Yes. Um, <laughs> yes, but yes, yes. yeah, I used. To, I mean, Frosnick he played with Guttermouth at the Unitarian Church in Philly. Like this dude went on stage and broke my nose. He did not like what I was saying, and he like he he headbutted me. I was bleeding everywhere. We got kicked out. Our guitar player Alan was blind at night, and I remember they just. They kicked us out and we like they repossessed our gear for like the next week. Brian and I had to go down in Philadelphia and get our gear. It it was crazy. Throttle jockey was a mess. Throttle jockey was wild. Like this is why Brian doesn't remember anything because he's probably like, it's it's the worst shit. Like he has no. I'll ask him things and he's like, I don't remember being in this band. And I, I think there's things when you like you're a victim of stuff to how you forget it. I think he was a victim of throttle jockey because it was wild and there's no rhyme or reason to what we did. Uh, we played a show in Delaware talking about weird and Newark with anal cunt. Yep. And I, we had no business being on the show. It was four pop punk bands and anal cunt and their shows were so wild. And the guitar player from AC asked Alan, if he could use his amp, I was like, don't use it. Don't let him use your amp. Like if something bad happens, we have to leave. Delaware was so weird. You had like ex Nazis, uh, pop punk people. You had like the Boy Sets Fire, like very open minded collective people. It was weird. So, next thing I know, AC is playing 311 Sucks, and there's this kid, Jeremy Tarr. And I see Jeremy Tarr go through a wall. And Jeremy Tarr was not skinny. It turns out a couple of members who would end up being in Bad Luck 13 threw Jeremy through the wall. Uh, stuff is going everywhere. I rip the amp away, get Alan, we go in the car and the police are like, the police are like entering the building because a riot had just happened at, at this anal cunt show. And like Alan was blind. So I would, and I carried this fire, like this flash paper. And we had already gotten to a fight. Our drummer, Mike, was a lot younger than us. And these guys tried to beat him up. So I threw flash paper in this guy's face because they're going to beat up Mike. So this giant flame comes. So that stops one fight. And then on stage, it's just this wildness. And Alan's hair caught on fire. And he can't see. So, and we didn't know it. Because I would put the flash paper on the end of my headstock. And so his hair is on fire in flames. <laughs> I just remember Brian patting his head down. Like, you know, trying to get the fire out. It just... <laughs> It was just like one thing after another with us. Um, we played in, in St. Mar- or Oil City, Pennsylvania, and Brian. we both had vans. Brian, for whatever reason, wanted to go in his van, and the van broke down. We're stuck in the middle of the night in western Pennsylvania, and we got a tow truck, and there's only one room for one person, so Alan goes, because, you know, Alan can't see. So Alan goes to my friend Rob's house in Pittsburgh, and it, it's... It's easily a hundred miles and we had to hitchhike from oil city to fucking Pittsburgh and we're at a gas station and it was, uh, our friend Mike Barzik was playing drums with us. He was in super I five with Eric and he owns a studio. He, uh, so we hitchhiked from oil city to Pittsburgh with this guy and he was fucked up. I think he was on acid. He was talking about like listening to like techno versions of Pantera while on acid and that's all we did for two hours listen to like pantera <laughs> techno versions of pantera it was crazy so it like and throttle jockey was just like an outlet like like instead of an acoustic guitar i had like an electric guitar and i remember like i remember that lane meyer show at skaters world was that with digger or was that with edna's goldfish do you I know think, i think it was digger because it was on where I, this is a very specific detail but was there a stage or was there just the floor Maybe there was a stage. I have pictures from that show. I think it was a stage. The uh, the Edna's Goldfish, I do remember that show. That was Digger and Edna's Goldfish played, because I remember the, the Edna's Goldfish played, and it was one of the sickest live things I think I'd seen at that time, because they, they, they were like, the the fucking guitar player did like a lap around the place, and the drummer was like, had just as much presence. They were a ska band, right? 
Yeah, they're a ska band, yeah. Yeah. Um, actually, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm thinking of the Eclectics. That was the band that was amazing. And as Goldfish, I do not remember that. Okay, so this was a different show because Thrawn's like you played Scare, Scares World twice. So that was, you must have played the Digger show. Yeah. I do remember playing that show with you guys, though, because that was the show where you yelled, play Spindle. Well, I remember, and very vividly, Lanemeyer played in Westchester, right, at the YWCA? We played a lot of Jersey and Pennsylvania spots, so I'm guessing yes. Do you, wait, do you, can, do you have an idea of what year? I would say maybe like... It's like 98, 99. 98 or 99, because I remember like Sean was still in your band, and I knew Sean from Allen, and I remember like getting like a very bad vibe from Sean. Like he didn't want to talk to me or something. I was like, Oh fuck. <laughs> yeah. I and, can see that. Yeah. And I was just like, okay, but that's, I remember Lane Meyer playing in. Wait, was Alan, was Alan still in the band or was that when he, went I don't, out? I don't, I don't think he was. In okay. The band. Yeah. Yeah. Cause there was like, there was that whole revolving door at some point, but yeah. I, I do remember a Westchester show. There was some show we played with like, Digger, I think in Weston, it was a stage and it looked like it was a hall. It was very lit. I don't know. I just vividly remember this shit. Um, the fucking flash paper story, dude. I mean, I've told that so many times in interviews, especially in like, I think it was all of the, the Pennsylvania ones. Where it was like right. with Chuck and them. Because that, I mean, that's that story has lived on. Because it, it like, smelled <laughs> so bad. And, and we, when we were oblivious. We're like, what the fuck smells like that? And it was Alan. And and Alan has passed. He had like a genetic disorder. Like he he died a couple of years ago. But like oh, shit. that. Like he he was a trooper. Like I heard he was we pissed. Were... I mean, obviously so. But I thought he was like super pissed at that show. N- no. Oh. No. He was just like, oh, my hair's on fire. Like <laughs> we would just put him in the fucking van and go. Like he he was the best. It, it came to a point where like it just wasn't clicking, and he didn't play with us any longer. But. I mean, he he was very influential with me. Like he was such a great songwriter and guitar player. He didn't give a shit. Like he was playing music. Mm. Like and he was very sick. He was way sicker at the time than we knew too. So like he would just get in the van. There was times like I remember when we played a show like another North that Dillinger Four show in North Jersey. We played in South Jersey during the day. It was the day after the last Plow show the first time, and. So it was like, we didn't have a drummer. So it was like Brian, myself, and Alan, and my friends from Detroit were driving from South Jersey to North Jersey. And Alan was just smoking cigarettes in the back of my van, drinking. I didn't, I don't know if I drank. I probably drank it there, but just like, he didn't give a shit. He was awesome. And, and I think we would have, like, I think we would have, like, kept putting his hair on fire if he stayed in the band. I don't think he was in the band much longer after that. But, you know, like, it was an accident that became like a gimmick. <laughs> did you like? Did, yeah, sorry, go on. No, no. What were you gonna say? You know, like, did you did you understand that the the because you even as you positioned this part of it and you talk about thr- throttle throttle jockey, you're like, this was like a time where you think Brian is like f- trying to forget it because it was just such a fucked up time. Did you guys realize what a shit show it was and you kind of just lived in it, or it just circumstance made it like that i just think that's how my whole life has always been like i live in chaos <laughs> like my life is chaos you know that's kind of like what i brought to playing music and that's why i stopped playing live because you you talk about this in your podcast like when you know it's time to stop yeah. you know and there's people that are like lifers and you know for me at like 24 I was, we did a band called new dance show. We played a lot, but we started playing bars. I'm like, I can't keep doing this. Like now, now this is getting out of VFW halls and going to bars. And now people are drunk and they really don't get it. And, and I had to stop. I was like, I just, I don't like doing this because no one is going to get this. <laughs> like now, I'm, now I'm getting legit fights on stage at bars. How and many fucking fights did you get in? constantly i mean i i would say like every third show and just because my personality because like the crowd participation people were not participating i made them participate like it's going against human yeah nature, you, you right? broke down the wall like you're yeah like, i'm going to talk to you they're like you're not allowed to talk to me. you're like fuck that yeah. shit i'm going to and, and no one and no one did that like weston was funny and they would talk to the crowd but they weren't making them participate 
Right. You know, I always looked at it as more like deranged Weston. Like we were funny, but it was like for it's me, like go either way. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. I was doing it to like humor myself because I was bored. It, it was just so chaos with throttle jockey, but we played a lot and you know, we put out good records. My favorite songs that I did were in throttle jockey. Cause I was just like 19, 20 years old, fucking repressed this shit, you know, living in this apartment with my friends who like, it, it was just this weird time and just wrote all these songs and we played a lot and it was a good band, but Brian, you know, he did it as a favor. Like, and he was bored. Paul broke up. So Brian would just come and play that. We just hung out. I think he texted me after his interview and he's like, dude, he goes, Tom was texting me, asking me all these questions about like throttle jacking stuff. And he goes, I felt bad. Cause he's like, I didn't remember any of it. Any of it. Yeah. Like, he so didn't maybe it's like some abused child shit where they don't <laughs> remember their, their past. But you know, I mean, Brian, Brian was with, did it till the end. He did it for two years. And then one day, Brian, like we played, we did some shows in Chicago. We did some Midwest stuff. And he's like, Hey man, I'm quitting. I can't do this. Cause Thrall Jackie did a tour and we had, a, um, Brian played guitar at this point. We had a bass player and he was super into Christ. And, um, <laughs> it was weird. He was reading Bibles on the van and, um, it, he was trying to convert us and it was fucking bad. And Brian's like, I can't play. I don't want to play music anymore. I'm going to go to North Carolina and do school. I was yeah. like, okay. And then, then they had the second plow show when narcolepsy came out and I played those shows with them. They're like, you can't do band stuff. You have to play acoustic. So, you know, I don't blame him. I mean, it was, it was time to end it. It was just so chaotic. After that, I just started playing acoustically by myself and do you, do you remember Alan's brother had a friend? I think his name was Avi and he put shows in his basement. Maybe it was Avi. Uh, Emery. Emery. Yeah. yeah. We played shows. I mean, remember, I remember playing like with humble beginnings in his basement, uh, like solo. So then I started playing shows by myself. I ha I'm trying to find the flyers. Cause I always mention this in every interview. There's the, an archive that has a lot of show flyers back then. And it's by year. Do you know what year? that was when you started playing down in Emory's basement? No. 98, 97, 98. Okay. Because I'm like, I'm trying to look for it. See, because I do remember that you did play solo with an acoustic guitar. Was it just under Tom Martin? Yeah, it was probably like Crazy Tom Martin or something. How'd the crazy um, part come up? Did you give it to yourself? Did someone say, give that to you? Someone gave it to me. And I think the crazy thing happened maybe later. Like, uh, my friend Will Noon Evidently in Westchester, like, like the p older people than me would call me that. And I never realized it. And one night I drank like a 40. I was fucked up. I was like in my malt liquor phase. And I just heard, oh, look at crazy Tom Martin. And I was like, what? I'm not crazy. And then and Will Noon, uh, Will's a good friend who played in like Breaking Pangea and Stray Light Run. And he played drums in fun, like. He's another guy who transitioned me in my next phase of my life musically. Like, he kept introducing me to people as Crazy Tom Martin. And I was like, yo, that's fucked up. I'm not crazy. And so that's how that happened. <laughs> so then they're like, oh, you don't want the name? Now we're really going to keep it. We're really going to get it. Yeah, like the name. only nickname I've ever had, that was that. So I was like, so for all my social media shit, I just put Crazy Tom Martin. Did, did Creep put out any of the throttle jockey stuff? No, I did. I put out a split with Plow, which is awesome. The Plow stuff is really good. And then there was this label at Delaware called Suburban Legends, I believe. And they were all high school kids. They went to Silesiana, which was the school that Sean, Joel, and Brian went to, Catholic boys school. And they put out, they needed to do a school project. So they put out a fucking throttle jockey record, which was called At War With Fashion, which is my favorite stuff. We recorded it and throttle jockey played a show in Ithaca. And Eric and I drove home from Ithaca and started mixing at five o'clock in the morning on no sleep for like 24 hours. And it's one of my favorite records. It just sounds, it's, it's gnarly sounding. So they put it out for their high school um, project, <laughs> their senior project. <laughs> Is it available anywhere? Is it online anywhere? Yeah, I found it last night. It's on YouTube. Oh, okay. Um, Do you have like the audio? 
yeah, the audio is on YouTube of the record. I, I can send you out too. Um, I just found a live throttle jockey record. Eric is like cleaning out his studio and he did the welcome to the creep house, whatever series and throttle jockey played it. It's pretty crazy. I have to edit it. Once I edit it, I'll send it to you. I don't know if I'm going to put it out because it's fucking, the banter is like, Oh fucked man, up. dude. To, to, to today's standards, the banter's fucked up. Eric's like, dude, I don't know. Oh. Like, he, he, he's like, you say some fucking crazy shit. And it's 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 pretty crazy. Yeah. It like w- it wouldn't like fly in today's standards, I guess. I don't think it would, but it's 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 nothing like I've always had the same like more like standards of how I speak. So it's it's nothing derogatory. Yeah. It's just me mumbling to myself and it's fucked up. So <laughs> It sounds great, and it's just like the banter is wild. So I talk a lot of shit in it. So I gotta, um, I have to edit it just for the sake of um, personal relationships. Like I call people out on it. It's fucking crazy. You should um, seriously like put that shit on Bandcamp. I mean, it's free. I am. I am. Yeah. I'm gonna do like a discography of all that stuff and put it on Bandcamp. I just um, my my the last year of my life has been pretty crazy busy so and yeah, eric's been it, busy yeah it definitely is like a very time consuming thing like i have all these vhs tapes from Lamar shit and it's like i just if i had the if i could find the thing to digitize it and figure that out i'd probably sit down on a saturday and a sunday and just fucking do it but i'm like oh god it's just so time consuming it's it's it, it's awesome to archive stuff i have everything i've ever done and i'm just i do it very slowly and i do it for myself because there's no market for Tom Martin. And that's why I stopped too. It's like, once people stop calling me to play, like I'd book shows and bars in Westchester, like once or twice a year to play. But like, I was like, fuck this. Like there's no demand. Cause it changed after 2000, everything just went. And after, after throttle jockey, I did a tour with digger playing guitar and digger. And, Which album was that on? Was that the casino one? Uh, it was before that it was in between promise and Monte Carlo. Okay. which was the one with the casino. I did a tour with them. I don't think they knew what they were getting into, but like, I would just go to digger shows and hang out. Like I really liked digger. They were like yeah. a less funnier, more technical Weston. Yeah. That's a great way you know, to, to describe Westing, them. Weston got lame, you know, like Jim well, got James serious. It got really serious after I call left. it, I call it lame. And you know what? I'm glad that Jim turned into James Alex and reinvented himself I think that's important. Like the beach slang shit's awesome. The Western shit was lame. Like it ruined it. Like, I don't want to, like, why would you want to, your summer dress is boring me. No, that's exciting. How is that boring? <laughs> like, I didn't understand it. <laughs> it was such a transition because it went from super goofy to like, got beat up was a little bit more like structured with goofiness. And then when Chuck left, it went to this the Saturday matinee was just like serious. And then they got it's, keyboards it, and stuff. I was like, I can't yeah. do this. It didn't match. It didn't fit. It didn't match. And I would go to Weston shows post uh, Chuck and heckle them. Oh, I got to like, imagine play galaxy. Just fuck it. Like it was bad. And, and Dave, like Dave is great. Chuck and Dave are awesome. I saw them in the reunion shows. Yeah, I see the like, picture on your Instagram. I haven't yeah. had this up, and my favorite thing is your Law & Order sweatshirt. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's so great. <laughs> I own 10 Law & Order hoodies. I get one every year for my mom for Christmas. I think she thinks I like the show. I'm more in a cold case. So I, I literally have like 10, 12 Law & Order shirts. <laughs> so um, perfect. Hoodies. But go on. But yeah, but Dave, so, though, you were fucking with him. I'd just go and fuck with them, but I would go just show up at digger shows. I remember driving to Allentown and just showing up and them taking me to one of their shows in Jersey with like Plan A Project and Anti Flag at like a hall. Like I just loved digger and I would just show up. So this is before Phil died, but Phil was out of the band. They had many different guitar players and Chris Benner called me up the New Year's Day, 1999. He's like, do you want to try out for digger? I don't know how to play other people's songs. You know, I just write my own. So I went, tried out, got in the band and did a tour with them with 10 foot pole, diesel boy, catch 22 and no use for a name. And that was wild. Wow. And, you know, was that on the split when they did with Weston? It was the, uh... it was after it was, okay. it was after. I love that split. 
it's a good split. Yeah, those Digger songs were fantastic. But Digger was great, you know, and the day that my first time rehearsing with him is the day that Phil died. So that was tough on me. I was like, fuck. Wow. Like the curse of the Lehigh Valley. But Digger was a was for me was like a good thing. I was not singing. They wouldn't let me sing. I duct taped my mouth in Texas. I remember Chris was like, you need to jump. I was like, dude, I don't jump. I have no hand-eye coordination. You have to do the punk jumps. And then I would sing backups and they, they wouldn't let me. So I had to like, I duct tape my mouth on stage. Like, and I think I spooked those dudes, but they were, I mean, Digger was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> like, like that was, and, and I talked to Chris from time to time, but like, I remember like them just like, and we'll wrap this up, but I remember my sister lived in Atlanta and my parents surprised me you know, they wanted to see me play and Chris and Matt thought it'd be a good idea to send me home because my parents were there. Cause I was just too crazy for them. And cause I had a, I would eat Reese's peanut butter cups. Okay. And I would sometimes leave them melted in the seat by accident. <laughs> and they thought I was fucking with them by, by leaving them melted, but I'm just a mess. You know, <laughs> you know how it is in a van. You just leave shit in the van. You don't yeah. need to do it. Yeah. And I remember them being like, you got to go home. I was like, yo, I've committed three months to this shit. Like, it will be fine. And it was fine. I got to play my favorite songs with with my favorite band at that time. I had no idea that you played with them. Yeah. Um, Did you like it, though? Like, did you like the fact that you got to just experience that full tour? Because you you went on a smaller one with with Throttle Jack. Right. Or not with Throttle Jack. You did that with 30 Refreshment. Right, and then you got to do like a full one with a band you loved, and then these songs like did did that kind of just fulfill and like that thing like fulfill something at the end? You're like, okay, cool. I don't have to keep doing this. It was great, and that that was there. I was like, and I was working on like a record by myself. I was like, this is awesome. Like, but these dudes like were totally different, you know. And and I got to like you know playing clubs, and it was good. In in which it was very important to like what I do now. Like Digger was like a big deal for me that no one knew I played it. It was awesome. I was so anonymous. Yeah, and I can't believe I didn't know that. Like I remember playing in North Jersey in Boundbrook at the Palace and seeing lots of people from like Throttle Jockey and Third Year And That was like a good way to go. It was just like, and then after that, I did lots of other stuff and you know I play occasionally. But your podcast is very important for people to remember, like that North Jersey scene because it evolved in so many different ways. And the, and the people that seem like small players did great for themselves. Like, you know, whether it be like Gabe or Brian Fallon or the people that were just like lurking that no one knew, you know, like, yeah, those are those are important times. And like our bands were people's first time seeing shows. Like, imagine that the first show someone sees, they see me fucking singing like it's true, <laughs> you know, like and, and that's that's awesome. Yeah, I mean, like these these people that you mentioned. I mean, you are some a person, a name in their vocabulary. They're like, oh yeah, fuck yeah, I totally remember that. And then you know, then they go off and you know do whatever. It's not making them any bigger, you know, than anyone else. But it's like that that scene. There are certain things that stick out. I mean, there's I'm sure there's some bands too that played, and I'm like, I just I literally have no clue. But there were certain always bands or people that I to this day I'm like, they just. I, it's like I just remember them specifically because of just their style or like you, like, you know, just the thing that you did, it's, it stood out. And that's why when, you know, you were like, I'll do this. I was like, Oh, hell yeah. <laughs> like, and and thanks imagine. for letting me do this. Cause I don't like, again, like I'll, I, I like to tell stories. I don't write it down. I don't think it's important to write it down. But like when I see yeah. people, I'm like an old man at this point. Um, but the, you know, the importance of what this music did culturally, I remember being in Russia Six years ago, an anti-flag was playing. And I had a plow hoodie on and just talking to them about, you know, plow. Wow. And it's 25 years removed, 20, 25 years removed. But like that whole scene is it, it is very important. And you don't know who is listening to it. So I think I think like for archiving reasons, like this is very important. Yeah, I was stoked when you reached out and said you listen to it. It's like that was really because I, I didn't think this would be a podcast that you'd listen to for some reason. Like, I don't I don't know why. Um, and then when you said that, I, I felt, I was like, that's, that's like, I felt like, like, that's really cool. Like, yeah, it's, you know. it's a great podcast. It, the, the bad thing about it for me is like, it makes me think 
I don't think about this stuff. You know, I think about making sure that little pump doesn't have a bomb on stage when he goes on. I don't think about, you know, the humble beginnings or, you know, dog pound or any of this North Jersey stuff or like, you know, I don't think about that stuff. I think about what's present. So when I listen to like sicko, you know, like these bands, like these podcasts, like, holy shit. And it's awesome. But I can't go to sleep because then I'm thinking about where I was at that point. Wow. So that's wild. Yeah. And so this is this is good to talk about this stuff because like I don't where, where I'm at in my life. It's not it's not really a thing. Yeah. Unless it's not I, constant. Unless when Eric and I talk, we like to go in the time machine. <laughs> but usually Eric talks me off a ledge <laughs> when I call him. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Well, I am I am going to fucking wrap this up, even though I think this is great. <laughs> I've like really fucking enjoyed this a lot. <laughs> Good. Well, thanks for uh, thanks for teaching me how to use Skype. I, I had well, that was that, that was really okay. That was the funny thing too is that before, <laughs> so anyone listening, I always record on Skype and everyone's always thrown by it because they're like, we we never had this before, and I'm like, we'll just go and download it. And so Tom writes back, he's like, the last time I used this was when I talked to someone over in the Middle East, and I'm like, this is gonna be a really good interview. <laughs> um. I used it a couple of times. I did a podcast with Matt Pryor from the Get Up Kids like five, six years ago. Really? Uh, yeah. What? And it's it's pretty crazy. That's the only other one I've ever done. It's and it's way different than this. It does not like talk about any of this stuff. It's 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 a it's a crazy listen. It's totally different. Um, was it one that you guys did together, or he had a well, podcast? Well, he had a podcast. That you were on he it. had a podcast, and like I was a guest on it. Holy shit! <laughs> and um. That's find that one because that one's like that's like the other side of my life <laughs> you know that has nothing to do with this stuff but this this stuff's important like it, it teaches you like through punk rock and the values of that it teaches you how to like you know be an adult like punk rock is very like if you navigate it the right way it, it helps you in your life you know maybe some people say that about krishna too but it's 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 it's, it's my life is very crazy within like what I do for work and the punk ethic helps it. Do you think that would be your answer for the, cause I always end with like, Oh, what is that rock. what we're doing? Well, <laughs> you, well actually I always have, I was going to act cause people started doing that recently. And I'm like, is the interview before you, I just did, which is a crazy, crazy one, which I feel like the, la the, the leading up to yours, I feel like there's such this, I don't want to say misfit. Cause that sounds, that's, it doesn't sound like negative, but there's like this, playfulness of characters that I've talked to or people I've talked to in the leading up to your interview where I think this is going to fit so well. And it just, it just happened out of nowhere. Who is that with? Um, well, I interviewed Travis from Buddyhead. Oh, wow. And the one before yours is this guy that there was a, and I didn't know what it was. So he, uh, he was like, I have this really great story. And apparently, um, or, I mean, people listening to yours, they've already listened to this one, they know it, but I, I, there was this message board, all bands that, like started having message boards and shit on their like, forums or guest books on their web pages when websites started coming out. And this name came up and started fucking with bands. And for some reason, my band took the bait and just made this turn, like turn in this war with this person. I totally forgot about this. Um, and this guy, uh, so I find out through talking to him and he goes, yeah, like that was me. And for 20 years, no one knew who this was. And again, I forgot about it, but it, he talks about how he came up with the persona and why they did it and how it led to like this really successful, like career that he has had now and comedy. And it's why, who, who is it? Who is it? Uh, it's, uh, Chris Gethard. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's crazy. And it's like, <laughs> I, I have never heard of him. Um, and then I like look research. I'm like, wow, this guy's like, a, this guy's done a lot of shit. And then to ro to find out that this was the thing that like, cause he was big into Andy Kaufman and right. he, this was his first like experiment with it. And it went really well to the point where he like, he, he was like, I got to shut this down because I'm about, I'm going to get my ass kicked at punk shows. Cause no one knows who I am. And if they did, they'd fucking kill me. <laughs> That's awesome. I mean, yeah. listen, I come from the Andy Kaufman ideology also. So that's what I'm I saying. Mean, like it fits clearly like that it, it like between Travis and, and him and you, like you guys just had this different 
viewpoint of where you're like, I'm kind of going to just f- fuck up, fuck up shit. Yeah. And I love that. I met Chris. I did a show with him. Uh, I put on a Chris show and I like to talk shit. And I was about to say something derogatory about Doc Hopper for whatever reason, because I knew he likes that stuff. And Chris from Doc Hopper is Chris's sound guy. <laughs> is it really? <laughs> oh, my God. So, uh, very interesting. That's crazy. Like, but but Chris, I mean, he he he's awesome and he he supports you know, that kind of like what we did then, like that music. So that's awesome. I didn't know that. Yeah. You have to hear the interview because it's so (laughs) different from any of them. And it's, it's so crazy, especially from just this little, it's, it's going even further down into that, that time period where this was just this little blip in time, but caused such a stir and it wasn't a show and it wasn't a band playing it and sign. It wasn't like someone recording stuff. It was just someone from the scene infiltrating this new thing which was guest books and going i'm gonna fuck with someone like uh anon- um, anonymously and that's it, amazing and then it led he's like he's like honestly he's like this is a big thing of that helped me go into the whole comedy direction i was like that's crazy dude yeah so wow it's it's so fucking cool yeah so that's i kind of this is like the things that i get out of doing these just these stories are so great because i mean i again i've said this many times i've never stopped for thinking about this i'm also a single guy you know just turned 40 living in north carolina all i do all i have is time right and so this shit is just it's always it's always in my head it's just amazing to me when people are like i've never thought about this in so long i'm like damn that's crazy to me i mean i i think about it but i like like i said like being my thing is always like with music reinvention and sustaining, you know, so moving forward, like I see the parallels like to it. So I, I think about the past a lot, but I have to move forward with what's new, like what new SoundCloud rapper I have to deal with. Um, (laughs) and, 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 and just, I know I'm blabbing, but, punk is very stale right now like rap is like this this new wave of hip-hop is like it the shows are fun like it's like a different kind of community and everyone in their 40s should go see one of the fucking lil's play whether it be you know lil pump lil xan you have to go and watch this shit because it's wild (laughs) okay i'll have to definitely check that out though i mean (laughs) i went to a hip-hop show last year there's this thing called Hopscotch down in Raleigh, and it's a, like a like a festival that takes over the whole town. And I went to, and they have these free shows around town until they're like from a, it's like one in the afternoon until five. So me and my buddies went around, and just got hammered, and saw these free shows. And we what we pumped and we jumped into a hip hop show at the Poor House down here, and it was so much fucking fun. Like it's watching these. It's guys. fun. It's it's fun and like watching it from backstage is even crazier, but I, I feel like hip hop is like that. It's, it reminds me of like what was, what we were doing in the nineties in early two thousands. Interesting. So what was, what was, did I, did I answer the question about how it pertains to me? Well, uh, well, what do you want to plug? Do you want to plug anything? I have nothing to plug. Um, okay. <laughs> I just like, Did thanks you... for having me on here. And there's, there's nothing for me to plug. I mean, I'm just, if you see me, don't be afraid. I won't pull anything out of my pocket. <laughs> I will let your hair on fire with flash <laughs> paper. <laughs> I, and you know what? I started like in in the mid 2000s. I started putting fucking food back in my pocket. <laughs> so now I'm drunk and doing this shit. I, I, <laughs> I was explaining to like one of like my assistant at work the other day. He asked me something about I was on the phone with a friend and they're talking about food in my pocket. And he goes, I heard you did that. Is that real? I was like, yes. <laughs> and nothing good came out of it. He's like, why would you do that? I was like, I explained it to him, the real reason why I did it, but which I'm not going to explain here, but okay. like, <laughs> like, he's just like, he looked dumbfounded, but you know, it's an icebreaker. I explained to him that it's an icebreaker. Like if you, if you're awkward and you want to meet people, you fucking pull a deli dinger out of your pocket from Denny's. We were in Denny's for like, 10 hours a day, every day. You get bored. You put things in your pocket. You collect things. <laughs> <laughs> so I started doing that again in my 20s, like just putting shit in my pocket. Like, and, and even now, like I have food in my pocket at all times. I don't use do the wallet, but 
if, if something bad is happening, I extend the olive branch of a chicken finger in my pocket. And there's nothing more relieving when there's someone with that you think might be carrying a gun and they're trying to hold you up for money and you just offer them a fucking chicken finger out of your pocket. It goes the right way. That happens. Will, that happens a lot. <laughs> I will leave it at that. <laughs> wow. Fuck. Everyone was like, it probably listening is like, ask him more questions. Like, no, nope. I will let you run into run into Tom and ask him, and then or just yell that at the stage of a rapper and say, you know, where's you know, pull out a chicken finger, <laughs> return the favor. Um, it, it's a, it's yeah. a good icebreaker. So okay, so what scene ethics to close us out? What scene ethics do you hold on to to this day? I, I hold the 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 community aspect of it and just. I feel with punk, you know, and there's different derivatives of it. It just, you know, being honest and, and making things easy. Like everyone now, like once instant gratification with punk, I felt like you had to earn it. And then when you got to where you needed to be, it was there, but now everyone just wants it instantly with like social media and everyone wants you know, the next spot. So with punk for me, like I learned patience. I, I learned how to like do things on my own and reach. I, I had obtained more goals through like the punk ideology than anything else. And, and, and I tried not to work with people that don't have those ideology. Like most people I work with come have some kind of punk or hardcore background. Like, I, I just think it's very important. 